Dirty rat. Dirty rat. <laughs> Captain Mike McNamara fishing with uh, Captain Dan Martinko. And today we're out in Appalachie Bay. We're leaving, we're really at the uh, end of the St. Mark's River, getting ready to turn into Appalachie Bay at the lighthouse, St. Mark's Lighthouse. Today we're just going to be fishing. I'm going to try to hopefully show you around navigating Appalachie Bay. We'll probably go over there and catch some redfish, show you some rock piles, and show you some uh, techniques we use in Appalachie Bay, but also hopefully steer you around Appalachie Bay and answer some questions on how to navigate. One of the things about Appalachie Bay when you're leaving the channel of St. Mark's, one of the most important things is to stay between the green, green and red channel markers. Don't miss any. Um, the Oyster Bar is an extreme low tide. We're in October. We got a full moon. It's a full moon day today. Uh, we got an extreme low tide and you can see these Oyster Bars are going to stick out. They go all the way to the ends of the channel. Stay between the greens and reds until you get out past the lighthouse. One thing to remember about fishing Appalachie Bay in October is uh, every one of these oyster bars outside the channel of St. Mark's River are going to hold speckled trout and redfish. There's a guide boat that just passed me. Every one of those channels between now and mid-November is going to hold trout and redfish. Always check the points. Fish the oyster bars, check the points on the way out. Catch a lot of good fish right here without even leaving the river mouth. This segment brought to you by Blue Water Outriggers, everything for your outdoor adventure. Marker 14, which is the entrance to the East River. Out here in front of me is the East River. Oyster bars kind of protect it, and it's a maze to get back in there. Most charts will show you the deep water and how you get back in the East River. The East River, whether it be fall or spring or even wintertime, are gonna it's gonna hold redfish, trout, and flounder. It's a great place to fish. You just gotta find your way in. I'm at marker 14 with the red light, and that's really the entrance to get in. Just be careful with the bars getting in. Once you find your way in, you'll be okay. Right now we're stopped next to green number nine. Green number nine's follow the channel out. That's green number nine at St. Mark's. And where I'm sitting is, if I look behind me, which I'm not gonna look behind me, but if I look behind me, you can see the lighthouse. So what I'm facing right now is what we call the West Flats. If you come to green number nine and your intention is to fish the West Flats, green number nine is what's gonna take you onto the West Flats and get you past the oyster bars. So come to green number nine, hang a right, there's a post out there. I can see the post. It's probably about 500 yards, 1,000 yards out. Head to the post. In the distance, I can see Shell Point. And at, right in front of me now, I know it's October, a lot of trout being caught. But I see five or six or seven boats out here on the flats fishing for trout. So West Flats, great place to fish, beautiful grass flats. Um, green number nine, hang a right. Pretty safe. Be careful going over. There's no rocks. It's just all grass flats. It's a great place to go fish. We're in front of the lighthouse. Lighthouse is behind me about four or five miles. The first thing I want to do is make a disclaimer for bad hair day. I'm wearing the lake and bay. We're fishing today. It's going to go crazy, but that's okay. Hang in there with me. It'll be fun. I want to tell you that we're at what we call, and, and Jason panned over to us so you can see it, well, we're at what we call the bird rack. The bird rack, when you run out almost to the end of the channel, I think we're at like five in from the end of the channel the big giant sandbar right here and that's where everybody kind of comes and relaxes at the end of the day. It's a great place to come hang out, family and kids, and relax. Also you're going to see as we keep going, the National Wildlife Refuge 
stake line. It's, it's big white floating markers. You can't miss it. We'll run by some. There's other ways to get around Appalachian Bay, but I have to tell you, when you're at the lighthouse, everything on the east side of the lighthouse is going to be rocky. There's big rocks, rock gardens there, lots of rocks. It's real danger to navigation. If I have new folks and they're trying to learn Appalachian Bay, one of the first things I do is bring them to the bird rack, show them how to get around this big sandbar that we're going to be on, and get back to those National Wildlife Refuge white markers. The National Wildlife Markers will take you all the way to the Oscilla River. And there's nothing out there to run into once you get to the white markers. So what I'm telling you, if you're new to Appalachian Bay, use the white markers as kind of your highway to travel up and down the bay, probably east and west. If you're ditching into places like Stony Bayou or Pinhook and any, any of the other rivers, stay outside, get to where you want to go in, and then head in. It's just a lot safer navigation. Sooner or later, you'll learn the back ways and the ways around the rocks, but the safe way, stay outside and use those white markers. Uh, I just want to stop here and show you, we might, we might fish here on this low tide, but what we stopped at is a rock pile, and it's, it's about 1.8 or 2 miles offshore from the marsh of the St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge. You might be able to see the lighthouse behind me. Now it's uh, 6, 7 miles behind us. This is Cobb's Rock, and Cobb's Rock is one of these huge rock piles that are out here, 2 miles offshore. So you have to be careful navigating Appalachian Bay, and this will be a perfect example. It's a great fishing spot on certain tides. We're not really sure if it's going to hold fish today. We're going to check it out. But how I got to Cobb's Rock is I ran down that wildlife refuge stake line and then came in. So that's just safe travel. That's Cobb's Rock. It's on most charts. Just kind of keep an eye on it. Just one of the dangers. And as you can pan around, you'll see there's a lot of other rocks sticking out of the water today on this low tide. This segment brought to you by Woods & Water Magazine, providing outdoorsmen with timely news and information since 1978. Check them out on the web at www.woodsandwater.net. throwing a one knocker I'm throwing an ADL white spoon I've never really thrown the white spoon before but I like white so I'm trying it out but we're, dr we're drifting over this flat and we're really it's so clear we can sight fish for redfish we just seen a couple go by we haven't hooked any yet but we're, we know they're here it's just a matter of drifting sight fishing and catching these redfish we're, I want to see if I can get some to watch them eat the spoon Right, you, you've walked it and I left. Walked it right to it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another one with him. Look at the big trout with him. Look at the big trout with him trying to take it out of his mouth. Yep. He's got a trout bigger than the redfish. And he just came up and tried to take the spoon out of his mouth. The trout's right there, he's swimming away. If I could get this redfish in, I could probably cast back over and catch that trout. I'm watching him swim away. Can you still see him? Oh yeah, I still see him. He's right here. He's swimming away. The trout tried to come up. He was bigger than a redfish. This is probably a, you know, 16, 17 inch redfish. And a 20 something inch trout just tried to take it out of his mouth. He's right there. He went right on the other side of that rock. That was a 20 something inch rock, uh, trout. You could probably throw your top water over there. Right? Old top water 
water swimming through. The way it works. We weren't really sure, but it works. Very cool. Grab by his handles. He lets me in there. Thumbed him up. Yeah. He definitely ate it. Perfect. Very cool. Thanks for playing. Let me let this one go. Man, yeah, let me see his little fins moving. He's ready to roll. And go. Nice switch. Perfect switch. stopped the boat here is you can see where we were fishing a little bit earlier the water was crystal clear there were still trout and redfish there but right here in the front of stony bayou this little bit of deep water this creek you can see the water is really dark and because the water is dark right next especially now it's holding trout and the trout are a trout are in attack mode it's october it's fall plus they got dirty water so it won't take long to catch a trout This segment brought to you by Deep South Fishing Rods, technique-specific rods for today's versatile angler. My name is Jessica McCauley, and I'm the director of Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Division of Marine Fisheries Management. Based on a, a stock assessment by our Fish and Wildlife Research Institute this past year, um, that showed that in the northern areas of Florida that the stock was greatly exceeding the Commission's management goal. So our Commission is often looking for opportunities and ways to give back to the angling public. So based on that, they uh, increased the red drum bag limit from one to two fish in the northern areas of the state. We do a stock assessment for redfish every three years. And so um, that study had been going on for a long time. We collect fishery independent and fishery dependent data, and that's been going on probably since the 1970s. In addition to increasing the bag limit from one to two fish in the northern parts of the state, we also uh, established a statewide vessel limit of eight fish. And what we did in addition to that was remove what we called the um, off-water possession limit. And what that was, is that once you got away from the water, it only allowed a person to possess two fish. So even if you got those two fish to your home and put them in your freezer, if you got another fish, then you would technically be in violation. So we removed that and we replaced it with a limit um, 
adjacent to the fishing area, so say in the parking lot when you were loading your car, the bag limit would apply adjacent to that fishing site. And then as you were traveling down the road, we established a six fish transport possession limit per person. So that's just so you can transport the fish from the fishing site to your place of residence. And once you get to your residence, there is no bag limit uh, at your residence. There were some concerns at first about how the measures would affect the fishery, but we feel confident in the data and our ability to give back that additional fish in the northern parts of the state. And since we do conduct a stock assessment every three years and we do what's called a status and trends report annually, so if we were to see something that would be cause for concern, then we feel confident in our ability to make a change quickly to rectify that situation. We did hear some comments, especially in the northeast area of the state, around the Jacksonville area. They really feel like the habitat there is superior than it is in other parts of the state, and that's the area that um, escapement, which is what we measure, is the highest for redfish. Um, but also in South Florida, in addition to habitat concerns, you also have a lot more anglers in the southern part of the state than you do in the northern part of the state. So that also affects the um, management metric that we use to measure and determine whether or not we can um, give back or whether we need to reduce. At the November uh, commission meeting, the commission also, based on a positive stock assessment, had the ability to give back on spotted sea trout, and they gave back both to the recreational and the commercial sector. The commercial sector has been a small portion of the fishery historically, in recent years only about 2% of the fishery annually. So for the recreational sector, the commission removed the closed seasons, so now the recreational sector has year-round fishing. And for the commercial sector, um, they did have a three-month season, and in most parts of the state, they increased it to a five-month season, but in the northeast portion of the state, they increased it to a six-month season. Also at the November commission meeting, based on a federal stock assessment, the commission had the ability to increase the red grouper bag limit in the Gulf of Mexico from two fish to four fish based on that positive stock assessment. Red snapper in the Gulf is in a rebuilding plan and it's doing really well. People are seeing a lot of fish in the water and that's positive. That's exactly what they should be seeing. But what they're seeing is primarily a lot of either small fish or fish that are just above the size limit. And what needs to happen is we need to see a lot more older fish in the population. Red snapper get to be around age 60. And so what we're really missing is those older fish that contribute that disproportionate amount to the reproductive capacity of the population. But things are looking up. Fishermen are seeing a lot of fish out there, and that's exactly what we want. That's all positive. The fall season for red snapper, that's really been a, a positive benefit to fishermen. Fishermen really enjoy that fall season, and we would like to continue that in the future. The decisions would be made by the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council that uh, looks at uh, fisheries regulations for federal waters. And they'll look to continue that hopefully in the future, and they're also looking at continuing that for other reef fish species because it's been so popular. The regulations that we have, they're in place for a reason. There's a lot of uh, research that, and data that goes into that. But what we're trying to do is, in addition to giving fishermen opportunities right now, we're trying to provide fishing opportunities for future generations and make sure there's fish in the water and opportunities um, for people's children and grandchildren. This segment brought to you by Gulf County and Mexico Beach Tourism, the heart of Florida's Forgotten Coast.